Ladies and gentlemen, please help us welcome Senior Pastor of MCI in Colombia and founder of the G12 Vision, Pastor Cesar Castellanos. Well, greetings to Pastor Bert, to Pastor Charney, and to everyone participating in this conference. I pray that the Lord will minister to you a lot during the conference. I believe that this is a divine appointment where the Lord himself is allowing us to gather together to receive from the source of his wisdom found in his word. I'd like to start with a scripture that is found in the book of Genesis chapter 1 and in verse 28. And I'm going to focus on the first part. It says that, and God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. But I'd like to start with a word of prayer. Father, right now, I pray that you will bring your grace and favor. And I pray that you bring your blessing to the life of everyone that is participating in this conference. I pray that the purpose, your purpose, be fulfilled in the life of every one of them. And I pray that this conference could fulfill all their expectations. And you, Lord, I pray that you will meet every one of their needs. Lord, I pray that you do this in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Well, I'd like to share a message called The Power of Multiplication. Now, it's interesting that the Lord himself, the first thing he said to the first couple was, be fruitful, and then he said, multiply. Now, fructifying and multiplying is subsequent to having a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. I believe that Christian life becomes a real good spiritual life when we have a personal encounter with Jesus. In my case, I came to know Jesus when I was 18 years old, and it was as a result of a philosophy professor who was an atheist. It turns out that every single one of his classes, he always spoke with the Bible in his hand, and he always said, this book, not only have I read it, but I've studied it. And he was always attacking everything sacred about the Bible, the deity of Christ, the virginity of Mary, the mystery of Trinity, and also the veracity of the Bible. And I knew in my heart that he was wrong, but I had no way to argument him to debate him, but yet the Lord, he put a zeal in my heart, and I said to myself, if he, being an atheist, has read the Bible and studied it, why can't I? So I thought, I'm going to read it, I'm going to study it, and I'm going to prove him that he's wrong. That day, I went home, and I found a Bible, and I began to read it, and I worked hard at having a good amount of time reading the Bible every day. And after several months, after I had basically read the Old Testament, I had read the four Gospels, but still, I had not experienced an encounter with Jesus. So I had a thought in my mind. I thought, Lord, I'd like to set an appointment with you. I'll see you tomorrow, 10.30 p.m. in the living room of my home. I chose that time because I knew that everyone at home would be asleep by that time. So, when I got home that night, I kept the lights off, I kept everything off, and I sat in my favorite couch, and I prayed a short little prayer. I said, Lord Jesus, I don't know you. I don't know who you are. But if you are the God of the Bible, I want you to do something with me. Change me, but do it now. Now, I had no um, understanding about prayer, but I did have common sense. If I wanted to hear something, I needed to wait for God to answer. So the next few minutes were very tense because I could feel like darts of the enemy that were being fired at my mind, and they were wrapped in thoughts, human thoughts, saying to me, who do you think you are to speak to God that way? God is not interested in you. You are nothing. And none of that affected me. I thought to myself, well, well, it doesn't matter. If he is the God of the Bible, then I want to get to know him. After about 15 minutes, something amazing happened, something extraordinary. The front door of my house was made of stained glass. And 
Then I looked towards the door and I could see from outside there was a light coming towards the door. It was the size of a person and it trespassed the door and it came all the way to where I was and it stopped right next to me. When that person that was standing next to me, I could feel there was a fire. I knew that that person was Jesus. And everything within me began to burn. It was so hot. All of a sudden, I felt that I was suspended between heaven and earth. And I found myself in front of Jesus. It was as though there were no other beings in the whole universe. It was just God and myself. In that moment, all alone with God, I was able to see myself the way God sees me. And the Lord, I was able to see him so great that he basically surpassed everything so pure and so holy. And I began to look at myself on the inside and I realized that I was a terrible sinner and I felt ashamed of myself. And I said to him, Lord, I am not worthy of you. I am a sinner. Get away from me, Lord. I am not worthy of you. And so I began to confess my sins. I said, Lord, I have done this, I have done that, and this, and that. And I started confessing every one of my sins until I felt that I had uh, gotten rid of them. When I finished making my confession, I saw a vision. I saw an open hand. It was the hand of a man. It was open, and it came inside my head and started descending all over me. But it descended in the form of a caress. And when it got down to the soles of my feet, I could feel as though tons of weight had been lifted from me, had fallen from me. And then I experienced something that I had never known before, and that is joy. I used to think that joy and happiness were the same thing, but no, there's a major difference. It's a huge difference because happiness is something that comes and goes, while joy is not something that comes and goes, it is permanent. Now, joy comes from human nature. Happiness comes from human nature, but joy comes from God himself. And the Lord, he has reserved joy only for those who have been born again. And because I was having an experience of new birth, the Lord, he filled me with joy. In that moment, I couldn't understand it as I understand it now, but I was able to enjoy that joy. And it was so much joy that tears began to come out of my eyes and rolling down my cheeks, but they were not tears of pain, they were not tears of sadness, they were not tears of shame, but they were tears of joy. I couldn't stand being seated down, so I fell on my knees and I began to worship God with all the strength of my soul and when I finished my prayer time, I said, Lord Jesus, if this is what you give, you will find me here. I will be here every day. I will seek you. The next day, I ran into a young man that I knew. And this young man, he was uh, experiencing a, something bad. Uh, he had been using drugs and alcohol. And he said, help me. I can't stand it. I feel like I'm going to die. And I looked at the young man and I said, Lord, what can I do? So I remembered that Jesus would pray for the sick and they were healed. And so what I did is I laid my hands on him and I rebuked all sickness and all the pain that was in him, in his body. And all of a sudden, the young man changed. He had a reaction and he said, I'm feeling great. And then he walked away and I thought, wow, prayer does indeed work. So the Lord, he was guiding me every single day in the way in which I should pray, the way in which I should relate to God. And after about three months, the Lord allowed me to go to a Christian church. And that is the place where I started developing in my Christian walk. It was the place where I also began to connect with ministry so that I could serve the Lord. But five years later, I remember that I was going to preach at a little church that I was pastoring. And so I came off the bus. I had to walk like two blocks in order to get to the church building. And that night I had said to the Lord, Lord, 
I want to experience what the Bible calls the joy of the Lord. I want to feel your joy in a supernatural way. And it turns out that the Lord granted me. He gave me an answer. And while I was in the bus, I could feel the joy of the Lord. It was supernatural. It was flowing within me. And I came off that bus and I was walking towards the church, but I was singing and I was praising God with all the strength of my soul. And I had my Bible. It was in a cover and I was holding it. I was so happy, but suddenly everything changed. It turns out that someone was walking behind me, but I decided to ignore that person. But suddenly, I felt a hand. It was the left hand of that man who was walking behind me. He pushed me up against his chest, against his body. And I was holding my Bible in my right hand. And then this man, he, grabbed a kni he took a knife and started cutting through my fingers. And I was holding the Bible with my hand and from the index finger he cut my tendon and the other finger he cut an artery and then i turned around and this man he stabbed me so hard he stabbed me in the chest and it scraped the heart but the blood clotted and it went around the valve of the heart and produced a heart attack. And as a result of it, for 30 minutes, I was dead. When the man stabbed me, the only thing he took from me was my Bible. He went running in one direction. I went running in the opposite direction. And while I was running, as I ran, I had a vision. I was able to see a summary of my life, everything I had done and not done for God. And I didn't want to die. Turns out that my daughter Johanna had been born three weeks prior. And my wife, a young, beautiful lady, I thought to myself, how can I die and leave my wife a widow so that someone else could marry her? I said, Lord, don't allow that to happen. I can't die. But you know, I finished running that block and then I fell. I was absolutely dead. There was no pulse. There was no breath. There was no heartbeat. But it turns out, you know, it's very interesting that when my body hit the ground, my spirit did not hit the ground. I remained standing. And I began going up. And while I was going up, I realized that I was not on my own. I looked around me and there were angels. My concept was that when a person died, perhaps God would send one or two angels to help you, that one would take you by one hand and the other, and they take you up. But you know, it wasn't like that. Turns out that I could see thousands and thousands of angels. They were formed in a tunnel of angels where it was basically an angel very close to the shoulder of another angel and they were formed in a circle. Every one of them were clothed in white. Every one of them had long white hair and every one of them were singing a song of worship to God. And for every tone that came out of their mouth, the joy within me was increasing in my heart. I was so amazed by the melody, by their singing, by the way they were worshiping God because it was thousands of angels I couldn't see the beginning of the tunnel of, of angels or the end of it. But all of a sudden, everything changed. And I looked at myself. And then I looked at the angels. And then I looked up. And I understood at the end of that tunnel of angels, I'm going to encounter God. And what can I present to God? What fruit have I got to show Him? Now, even though since the time I got born again, when I was 18, I was always winning souls. Every day I was preaching the gospel. And I thought to myself, what is 100 or 200 people that are still connected to the things of God compared to millions of people that are perishing? And that is the moment I felt anguished. And I said, Lord, how could it be that you would allow allow me to die. This is an attack from the devil. He wants to cut me off ahead of time. But I pray, Lord God, just as you overcame
overcoming death gave me the same power so that I could overcome death in your name. And I finished my prayer, and immediately I found myself back in my body. When I opened my eyes, I could see that all those that were around me were clothed in white, and I got scared. And I thought to myself, God, it cannot be. I am opening my eyes in heaven. No, please. And then I closed my eyes again. And when I looked at the people around me, then I was able to see the color in their garments, and I realized that they were not angels, but normal people. I could hear what they were saying. He has been there for 30 minutes. He's dead. He has no pulse. He has no heartbeat. He has no life. And then when they looked that I was moving, they said, he's moving. Then they took me to receive medical attention at the hospital. But that was an experience of death. 24 years old, like I said before, where God, he kept me, he kept my family so that we could continue moving forward, bringing forth the word of God. Now, Jesus, through the apostle John, said, Sure, most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone, but if it dies, it produces much grain. Now, Jesus, he is the only one who was born but knew that he had been born to die. He was aware of the fact that there was a specific day where he would give his life as an offering for the redemption of every single one of us. When you get to know Jesus, when you have had a personal encounter with him, and you know that your time has come to leave, you know that your destiny, your eternal destiny is assured. But there is something important that I want to emphasize here, and that is that receiving Jesus in your heart goes beyond just attending services regularly at a church. No, that is not the important thing. The important thing is that one knows that there is a change happening within us. And that the old man within us, who is a rebel, is no longer in our lives. That Jesus has completely taken him from us. That the death of Christ on the cross of Calvary is our own death. Jesus never committed any crime to receive punishment. He took our place. He suffered the punishment that you and I deserved. And when we believe in Jesus, when we receive him as our Lord, that is when we are surrendering our ego when we're giving him our old nature we're leaving it at the cross we need leave it nailed at the cross and when you do that that's what the apostle paul said i have been crucified with christ it is no longer i who live but christ lives in me and the life which i now live in the flesh i live by faith in the son of god who loved me and gave himself for me in other words christian life is a life of relationship. We start having contact with Jesus and we do that through his word. Now, the word of God is the one that stirs our faith and that faith brings us to surrender every area of our lives to Jesus. And when you do that, the Lord himself, he causes our body to become a temple. Our ego is crucified along with Christ. But the spirit of God, it comes and it dwells in a temple. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, He comes and takes control of our lives. And that is what is known as the new birth. And that is why Paul said, if you've come looking for Paul, you can't find him here because Paul is dead. If you have come to look for Jesus, you could find him here because Jesus, by his spirit, is now living in me. So when you have a personal encounter with Jesus, you are born again. You are born to a supernatural experience and you are able to relate directly with God. That is why the Lord Jesus Christ said, unless 
unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. The death of Jesus bore fruit. It bore abundant fruit. But also, if we don't die to ourselves, if we die to ourselves, we're going to produce abundant fruit and we will glorify the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. When you read the Bible, you realize that the one who wrote most letters in the Bible was the Apostle Paul. But when you start looking at the context of the Apostle, he was not an Apostle, but he was a persecutor of Christians. He hated the work of the cross. He would torture Christians. He received letters that gave him authority to incarcerate and to torture Christians. And he was so successful in Jerusalem, and that is why he also went to persecute Christians in other cities. But when he was on his way to Damascus, he was so angry, he was thinking and plotting about ways in which he could kill Christians, and that is when he had a personal encounter with Jesus. Now, the Lord God appeared in, on the way and knocked him off his horse and he said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And so he was afraid and he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is a hard thing to kick against the gods. And then he said, the apostle said, before he became an apostle, he said, Lord, what must I do? And the Lord told him, I need you to go to Damascus, go to a street called Straight, and there you will stay there until I tell you. So the apostle was completely blinded by the experience. And for three days he was at the place where God told him. For three days the apostle was blind. And while he was there, in that place where the Lord had shown him, it was the place where he experienced the encounter with God. Now, listen to what I'm saying. He experienced an encounter. An encounter. The encounter that Paul experienced lasted three days. It was not an encounter with religion because he was religious, but it was an encounter with Jesus. And because he had read the Bible a lot, because he had educated himself like a rabbi, he knew the Old Testament very well. In the three days, the Lord removed the veil in his mind and God brought understanding to him. That was the moment where his mind began to open up and he realized that the Jesus that he was persecuting was actually the Messiah that had been promised. And that is where he understood what we know as the steps for an encounter. There are five steps or five objectives to an encounter. The first objective is the assurance of salvation. And a person receives assurance of their salvation when they have an encounter not with religion, but an encounter, a personal encounter with Jesus. Generally speaking, while we experience an encounter with God, there is a supernatural experience. It's a special experience where you where God awakens people to the faith, where you know that if you have to leave this world, you know that you will definitely encounter Jesus. It is not something where one day you're a Christian and the next day you're a sinner and you just live your life in an up and down, a good day, a bad day, a holy day, a sinful day. No way. When you have a personal encounter with Jesus, there is an absolute change of life. Remember, my encounter with Jesus, I had never been to a Christian church. I had never heard the name pastor. But my personal encounter with Jesus on that night, it allowed me to experience new birth. And the only thing I knew was the Catholic Church. But it's not that I ever went to Catholic Church to Mass. What I did after I got saved is I would go and take a walk for two hours every day just talking to Jesus. And so I never bowed to any idols because I know that God is spirit and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. So I kept my relationship with the Lord until the Lord led me to a Christian church. In the case of the Apostle Paul, the Lord led him 
to a retreat. And while he had that retreat, he started thinking about scriptures from the Bible and realized that the only one who could give salvation is Jesus Christ. And so he received the assurance of salvation. That is why in the encounters that we do for three days, we make sure that the people will experience a personal encounter with Jesus. Because if a person has an encounter with God, they will never be the same. They will never go back to the same old things. The second objective of the encounter is to receive inner healing. People that have been wounded in their emotions, people that have been mistreated, perhaps since the time they were in their mother's womb, or when they were born, or even after they were born. A lot of times, those that hurt and wound others the most, they hurt those who are closest, or those that say that they love us the most. But when you're experiencing your encounter with Jesus, the Lord brings healing to all the wounds of your heart. The third objective of the encounter is to experience deliverance. The majority of people, due to the fact that they are raised in a society that is completely isolated from God, they open doors to things that are not right, to sins that are of a high caliber, where they get involved in the occult, in spiritism, where they worship idols, where they serve demons, and there it, it will not be like a small little doctrinal error, but it is demons that come and take hold of people's lives in order to control them. And that's why the third objective of the encounter is to experience deliverance. It is there where demonic powers cannot resist the presence of Jesus in people's lives. And that's why those demons come out of people's lives, leaving them alone. The fourth objective, the fourth thing the Apostle Paul experienced was the fullness of the Holy Spirit. It's where the Lord spoke to the prophet Ananias, and then the Apostle Paul received a visit from the prophet Ananias, who said to him, Brother Saul, the Lord who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Notice that the two phrases that we're reading, he said to the apostle, he has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. As you can see, the next objective is that we could receive vision. And the last objective of the encounter is that we could enjoy everlasting life by faith in Jesus Christ. Notice the five objectives of an encounter. The first objective, the assurance of salvation. Second objective is to receive inner healing. Third objective is to receive deliverance. Fourth objective that they receive vision. And fifth that they receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Now, after that experience, the Apostle Paul basically became a whole different person. A person full of faith, a person full of the anointing and the grace of Jesus Christ. And as he said it himself in the book of Romans, chapter 7, verses 24, through 25, as he was sharing his testimony, he said, O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And then he said, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And in chapter 8, in the book of Romans, in verse 1, the apostle said, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Notice that at first, he was saying that he was a wretched man, that he was not deserving of salvation. Woe is me, because he could not find a solution for his life, but then he understood the redeeming work of Christ, and that's why he said, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Notice that he was speaking about remaining in Christ, those who abide in Christ, those 
those who do not walk according to the flesh, but have left that world behind, but live according to the Spirit of God. In other words, in that encounter, God changed the life of the apostle, and therefore, the apostle became one of the greatest messengers, one of the most powerful messengers that you could find in the New Testament of the Bible and throughout history as well. The, the prophet Isaiah, who was one of the greatest prophets, he received a vision of redemption in a supernatural way like very few people have ever experienced it. He said, shall the prey be taken from the mighty or the captives of the righteous be delivered? But thus says the Lord, even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away and the prey of the terrible be delivered for I will contend with him who contends with you and I will save your children. That is found in Isaiah chapter 49 verses 24 and 25 in the book of the prophet Isaiah. It's amazing the questions that the Lord was asking his people. The captives shall the prey taken from the mighty or the captives of the righteous be delivered? Notice that in the answer, order is not the same as in the beginning, but the Lord himself, he brought clarity. He said, the captives of the righteous shall be delivered and the prey be taken from the mighty. The enemy, he had enslaved all humanity. Now, remember, when Adam sinned, he was a victim of the enemy's deceit. Adam bit the bait of the enemy, and he fell into Satan's trap. And as a result of his fall, the enemy was able to put humanity into prisons to keep humanity captive in captivity and all our descendants. But at the same time, the enemy was able to take everything that God had given to Adam. And the enemy became, he became a tyrant and he took for himself something that did not belong to him. When God asked the questions, he presented the condition in which we all found ourselves when we were prisoners of the enemy, when we were under financial oppression, the kind of things that the enemy had submitted us to. Jesus came to rescue, to deliver those who were being held captive. And the Lord Jesus Christ, he asked, he said, or how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man and then he will plunder his house? This is found in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 29. The enemy, he was that strong man. He was the one who had, was holding us in captivity. And there was a need for someone stronger than him. And we know that that stronger one than him is Jesus Christ himself. Now, how was it that Jesus rescued us? The enemy had established a tax in order to deliver humanity. And that tax was at the price of blood. It was the price for ransom. In Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22, it says, And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no remission. Jesus paid the price. By his blood, he was able to bind the strong man. The death of Christ on the cross was the greatest defeat that the enemy had ever has ever suffered. Not only did he uh, overcome him, but he also overcame every demonic power that was working for him. In the same way, he took control of the spoils and everything that Adam had lost, everything that the enemy had taken from Adam, Jesus was able to recover it for us by triumphing on the cross of Calvary. And he has put all those blessings and made them available to us. In the book of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, the word of God says, and Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that
that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And the Lord Jesus, before he ascended to the heavens, he said, but you shall receive power when the Spirit of God comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all of Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. As you could see, now the work of the cross, Jesus, he has made it available for every one of us. He has paid the highest price. Now, what we need to do is we need to understand everything that the Lord has conquered for us and we need to turn our eyes back to Jesus. We need to open our hearts to Him. We need to absolutely surrender our lives to Him and we need to start living in accordance to His Word. Remember, I got to know the Lord when I was 18 years old. I had a supernatural experience with Him. Since that moment, the Lord has been walking with me and I have been walking with Him. I have gone through struggles. Yes, I have been tested. I, basically, I have been medically dead four times. Accidentes, I suffered accidents. I was attacked in the street. I suffered assassination pero, attempt with great violence. Pruebas, but the Lord delivered me from every librado. one of those tests. And que tenga Jesús en el corazón, anyone who has Jesus no es in their no heart, it's not that you will Pasamos not be pruebas. tested. We pero are tested. Pruebas, but the Lord will deliver us in every one of those tests. Gracias he will give us victory. I'm so grateful that the Lord allowed me to personally encounter Him. As a result of it, my wife also came and became strong in the faith. She came to know Jesus. She surrendered her life to Jesus. She became an amazing woman of God like very few that I've ever known. My daughters, every one of them, they are involved in the ministry. Their husbands, every one of them, are also involved in the ministry. Every one of them are fruitful. And they are disciples, the disciples that God has entrusted us, not only in Colombia, but around the world. They are the finest leaders. They are so committed to the work of God. They are courageous people. They are very brave people. What can I say about that? I can say that the work of the Lord on the cross of Calvary was not in vain. It was a blessing so that we could reach many generations, so that we could save many lives. And I know that every one of you, you have great challenges ahead of you, and that is to be a messenger of Christ. Preach the message to the people closest to you. If you don't do it, I ask, who's going to do it? Don't you realize that the Lord has called us so that we could become an inspiration so that we could become a blessing to others. So don't be afraid of speaking to others about Jesus. Actually, when you have Jesus in your heart, He gives you His strength. It's dwelling in you and His strength. It causes you to go and win souls for Jesus. Today, I'd like to pray a prayer for you so that you could truly be born to the ministry so that you could give your best to do great things for God. And I know that the Lord, He is going to be with you. He will use you if you don't do it. Perhaps there will not be another person that could do it. You, right now, you have the opportunity to make the work of God great. Just as the Lord said to the prophet Isaiah, whom will I send and who will go for us? And the prophet replied, here am I, send me. It's very important for us to understand that the Lord, He will not pressure us. He didn't say to the prophet directly, I am calling you to serve me. But He said, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And that's why the prophet replied, Here am I, send me. And thanks to His answer, it was He was considered one of the greatest prophets throughout all times because He responded 
responded to God's call. And just as the prophet Isaiah responded to the call, it's important for you to respond to the call in a positive way. That you may say to him, Lord, here am I, send me. I'd like to pray for you if you'd allow me to do so. And if you are going to make this commitment, I know that I can guide you. So please close your eyes, place your hand over your heart, and repeat this prayer after me, saying, Lord Jesus, today I have understood your word and I turn my heart back to you. I surrender every area of my life to you. And I pray that from this moment forward, the Holy Spirit will be the one controlling everything in my life. Lord, I pray that this body will become the temple of the Holy Spirit. And I pray, O oh Lord, that you use my life so that I could make your kingdom great, so that I could preach your gospel in all the nations of the earth. Lord, I pray that I could be an instrument, a useful and powerful instrument in your hands, because my desire is to make your kingdom great. Lord Jesus, from this moment forward, you could count on me because I have always counted on you. I love you, God. In Christ Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. And to every one of you, thank you so much for connecting to this conference. I know that the Lord will continue ministering to you. Also, I want to say thank you to Pastor Bert and Charney. And I want to say thanks to the whole team, all the team that is working with Pastor Pretorius, everyone at the church, every one of the speakers and I pray that God will use you all in a supernatural way. Lots of love to you. God bless you.